This is The Baseline, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Welcome everybody, you're tuned to The Baseline, Cali Warren Shaw, discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. Two weeks left to go, and it's time to start the show. NBA season, the regular season wrapping up, but not without a little bit of drama, a little bit of talking, a little bit of balling, all of the good stuff that you come to expect as we start coming down to the wire. A lot of exciting stuff happening in the association. I can't wait to get right into it. So I'm rolling out the red carpet to my right-hand man, 50 Grand, NBA aficionado, www.shawsports.net, Big Kahuna PNC, my brother from another mother, Mr. Warren Shaw, repping out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Holler back at me, Mr. Shaw. Um, kind of like Mr. LeVar, are you, are you ready to talk that talk for us this week, man? I ain't got the swag like LeVar Ball, man, but I'm definitely ready to talk NBA hoops with you as always, man. Salute, salute to all the fans and all the listeners of NBA Baseline. Great, amazing show on tap. So much to discuss as always as the season winds down and we get into the playoffs, bro. Most definitely, Shaw, most definitely. This week, we're going to touch on a team that we haven't had much opportunity to discuss. And while they quietly have walked themselves right in the middle of the pack of the NBA playoff picture, what is to come and what are the expectations for the Memphis Grizzlies? Shaw and I are going to use that as our second of the breakdown. We're going to dig right into what is the outlook for the Memphis Grizzlies? Can they pull out the unthinkable in what is very, very, very well like to be one of the most excruciating Western Conference playoff battles that will take place for this upcoming season? Also in our segment of The Drop, we're going to talk about which teams have the brightest future ahead of them. Could it be the Magic? Could it be the Suns or the Los Angeles Lakers? We'll be interested to hear what you have to say, but Shaw and I will kind of give you a little bit of the thought process to go along with what you should choose as being the team that you think that has the brightest future ahead. So those are two important topics we definitely get into. Of course, I covered it coast to coast where we discuss the news that's happening in the association. We appreciate each and every single one of you for hopping on board with us this week, joining along, discussing the news in the NBA. Be sure to get at my man Shaw at Shaw Sports NBA or get at me at Game Face Lee. We always encourage you to get at the show's Twitter handle at NBA Baseline. We are available on all the major platforms, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Microsoft TuneIn, Player FM, Google Music, also available on iHeartRadio and the Roku channel. To download any one of these platforms, allow us to be your go-to resource discussing all things in the association. Big shout-outs to our people, 16 Wins a Ring. 16 Wins a Ring, the up-and-coming, fastly known website that covers all of the NBA. You want great NBA content? Well, not along with the Baseline podcast and other great podcasts like the Driving Dish podcast, be sure to go to 16 Wins a Ring. You'll get all of your fill for the NBA. Go directly there. Download, listen, read, get absorbed. It's going to be a hellacious ride as we start nearing the NBA playoffs. You know how we do. You know how we roll. It's time now for the breakdown. Time to break it down. Put you down put the bone gristle. Time now for the breakdown. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA podcast. This week on the breakdown, we are going to talk about one of the teams that, you know, for the last few years, they have managed to really surprise a lot of people. I think amongst the NBA pundits, it's still a mystery how this basketball team winds up being relevant at the end of a season and actually winds up having us, you know, looking at the rest of the other teams. Like they are the litmus test of being that type of basketball team to say, if you are able to get past the Memphis Grizzlies, you really do deserve an opportunity to play for an NBA championship. And we've seen this year in and year out, maybe the last five or six years. The Memphis Grizzlies are a basketball team that by roster, by roster, by talent, they don't jump out at you. They don't, you know, uh, they, they don't wow you at all. But yet and still, they got enough wins. They're always an above 500 basketball team. They're a very well-coached basketball team. They're one of the toughest defensive teams, probably by defensive metrics. They are probably a top five each and every single year when it's all said and done. And they're always in the NBA playoffs over this, this impressive stretch. But are we coming to a point where we actually should be taking the Memphis Grizzlies as a legitimate playoff threatening basketball team? 
Deshaun, as we throw that question out on the basketball, uh, we throw that out on the floor, it is something that we don't have an opportunity to ponder too often because before we blink our eye, we probably don't have the Memphis Grizzlies as a playoff-bound team, and yet and still they wind up being a playoff-bound basketball team. Yeah, every single year this is a squad that, as you said, finds their way in even when they probably shouldn't, and you feel like they should blow it up and they should start over because the pieces maybe don't all fit together. Um, they get another 40-plus wins, sometimes even get to 50 wins, and, and, they're, and they're right there. I think this is a team that's very similar but on the opposite end – in some ways of the Spurs in terms of like they just don't get a lot of notoriety, but they've been very consistent and continue to be a, a decent organization, although they've had some turmoil, obviously, with their front office and the coaching situation with David Yeager, um, you know, over the last couple of seasons, they continue to get it done. What we need to figure out now is, you know, what's the best situation for this team as they're struggling right now? Seventh seed, they're not going to fall to eight. They're not going to fall out of the playoffs. And really, they're not going to get between four and five. So really, they're, they're right now in a battle with OKC for that sixth spot. And, I, you know, my question to you is, where do you think, where is their best matchup for them? Are they better off at seven in a potential matchup with the Spurs? Or is it the more obvious thing, getting up to six in a potential first-round matchup with the Houston Rockets? You know, I'm going to answer your question in a second, but it's it's interesting. As you were kind of talking about this, and I don't know, I've been I've been kind of like in a, I've been having a political state of mind recently. I don't normally like getting involved in politics. I believe, you know, in policy. And and when we look at the cert, the current climate right now, with the way that things are happening in the United States, you can't help but make certain comparisons with basketball and politics. For example. I look at the Memphis Grizzlies like the Affordable Care Act, dude. Seriously. The Memphis Grizzlies was, was formed together with an idea that they just want to be sustainable and successful. Then when they started seeing certain combinations, the grit and grind, and the emergence of Mike Conley, then there was that little small window of belief that they were going to actually be a credible basketball team. They made it to the Western Conference Finals, even when people didn't believe that they were going to make the Western Conference Finals. And while they did get bested by ultimately the brothers that you can basically, you know, in your comparisons, as you say, they're kind of like a mini San Antonio Spurs. It was a San Antonio Spurs that basically sunned them, you know, and kind of brought it back to reality. This is still a basketball team that continues to tread, tread, tread. And everybody... Even myself, you, Shaw, we've been talking about repealing and replacing the Memphis Grizzlies, like ripping this team apart and putting together something of a semblance that you can see down the road three, four, five, six years from now that they're going to be more than what we are seeing from this five, six year stretch. But to the populace and to the way that they have played the game and you can replace as many coaches as you want. They've been through what? Four coaches in six years. OK, you do whatever you have to do. The players still go out and they play. And their mantra has been grind it out until it can't be grinded any longer. Play that hardcore defense. Make the game as ugly as possible and give yourself a fighter's chance in the fourth quarter. And every single time I look at this basketball team, they stay true to form. It's feast or famine. They either look good doing it or they look bad against everyone else in trying to do it. So to answer your question, Shaw, if I had to choose between the San Antonio Spurs and the Golden State Warriors, for this year alone, given the, the makeup of this roster and the way that this team has always played, if Kevin Durant is not healthy enough by the time that they get to the first round, I know that there's speculation he's supposed to be back you know, by before the end of this regular season, but if the Memphis Grizzlies were to take on the Golden State Warriors in the first round without Kevin Durant, they could push the Warriors probably to six or seven games. If Kevin Durant is back there with that team, they have no shot because they have no matchup uh, semblance for a guy like Kevin Durant, which then leads me to the San Antonio Spurs. It would be easy to say that the San Antonio Spurs would be the better matchup. The problem is the San Antonio Spurs have Kawhi Leonard. The San Antonio Spurs have a plethora of talent from a depth perspective that will will kill the Memphis Grizzlies before they even sniff an uprising, an upheaval in matchup proportions. Well, I think, yeah, if you're any team at the bottom of this conference in the West, 
if you are going to have to play Golden State, you're going to want to play them as early as possible, you know, before KD potentially gets back, you know. But as we're recording, you know, rumors are coming out that KD may miss, miss, miss the next three games for Golden State and could be back for the final roughly three or four games for before the end of the season. So, you know, either way, you, you'd probably rather catch him, you know, kind of on the upswing, if you will, as he's trying to get his legs back underneath him. Um, but I don't know if that's really going to be a real interest of for, for the Memphis Grizzlies in terms because they probably are not going to drop down eight. You know, they're not going to lose the next these last whatever six or seven games here and drop down the eight seats. So it's really going to be a matter of San Antonio or Houston for them. And I think Rockets just may have too much firepower. I I although it, it seems crazy to say, I feel like San Antonio might be a better matchup for them um if those two were to play than than the Houston Rockets. Because I think Houston, although Memphis loves to play defense and feels like they, I think there's just too many weapons, healthy weapons for Houston for, for the Memphis Grizzlies to potentially stop. Yeah, well, I, and I agree with you. I think the other thing that you also have to put out there, Shaw, is that the Memphis Grizzlies have played the San Antonio Spurs and the Houston Rockets really throughout the this regular season. So from from a from even though you can rely on the fact that the Memphis Grizzlies have beaten the Golden State Warriors and it happened earlier this year, a say, uh, an argument could be made that this was at a time when the Golden State Warriors were not clicking on all cylinders, where the chemistry wasn't completely there defensively. Because I mean, the way that the Golden State Warriors were playing in the early outset of this season, if the Memphis Grizzlies can drop 120 on you, there is a serious problem with your defensive scheming and your defensive discipline, okay? And so we know that the Memphis Grizzlies might drop 120 once every 20 games, but don't tell me that they're going to do that consistently through a seven-game series in the playoffs. I, I just don't realistically see that happen. That's not them. That's not why you brought David Fisdale, and that's not the, the composite of your basketball team. So if there's a basketball team that is relatively – balanced from an offensive defensive perspective i i give you that definitely shaw that the san antonio spurs are the best matchup because we have seen times when the san antonio spurs while they have great ball movement they are not an efficiently well shot basketball team like they were back in 2014 this is still the same basketball team that plays excellent defense. And so when games become a defensive struggle between both of these teams, the Memphis Grizzlies will take that every single day of the week rather than trying to run up and down the court with teams like the Houston Rockets or the Golden State Warriors. Yeah, and that, and that's, that's definitely my point. I just feel like it seems crazy to say that if Memphis had a choice, they may be better off sitting in that seventh seed instead of catching OKC and getting up to six as that's currently stands. There's a huge game for Memphis and, and, and OKC coming up this week. I believe it's on Wednesday. Um, and that really could potentially, you know, be the determining factor of who ends up getting the six or the seven seed between these two rosters. But you you touched on a point there that I want to get get on here a little bit too. And what's your overall impression of David Fizdell this year? Because I feel like He's been you know, he's been everything that Memphis could have won in terms of the coach. He has he's adopted the grit and grind mentality. He's got no BS type of guy. He's had some great quotables out there with with the media in terms of shuffling his rotation and his lineup because he's still looking for the right thing uh, for this team to to kind of find their way down the stretch. And they've done this all without the help of the twenty five million dollar contract of Chandler Parsons, who was supposed to be that stretch three or that stretch four rather, um the guy who can be 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 on the wing and helping them with the three point shooting that they've lacked for so long. Parsons has been a non show and obviously he's out for the rest of the season and they've really still been able to get forty plus wins. You know, they'll probably get to about forty five or forty six wins to end the year. Uh, but what's your what's your impression of David Fisdale and what he's done with this roster? Well my impression of David Fisdale is he's exactly the kind of person that was cut from the Spolstra Riley cloth um you know one of the things that i think really has hampered the, the memphis grizzlies is is that they don't want to rock the boat um I, I think that they recognize after and you can you know we, we, we'll take this as far back to you know late 90s or 2000s and stuff when we looked at this memphis basketball team they had already been you know kind of raked by the coal so to speak you know when when they made that unprecedented move of sending paul gasol to the Los Angeles Lakers, you know, via through the savviness of Jerry West. And I think that if you're the Memphis Grizzlies going through such a, a horrible period of time where the morale, the organization, the play, the game itself was very low, they're at a point where people are kind of happy that this is a Memphis Grizzlies basketball team that is about the community, that is about at least being moderately successful. Um, and they've had a couple of stretches where they've looked really good. And I think when you have coaches that are very progressive minded, that want to take some chances and they clash with the philosophy and the mentality that of what the organization kind of represents, you know, this is what we're seeing. We see a lot of turnover 
and we see situations where you know you're just waiting when went waiting for the you know the, the 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 foundation to collapse on the building Fisdale has been the kind of guy he doesn't make any fuss he doesn't make any bones he uses what has been given to him and he maximizes what he can for what's being done. You know, some first head coaches, guys like Fred Hoiberg, guys like Billy Donovan, could have easily been under that same type of scrutiny, but they had superstars. Fisdale doesn't have any true superstars, and if they do, they're always injured, <laughs> right? So I like the fact that Fisdale doesn't make a fuss. He doesn't make excuses. He figures out a way to use the guys that he has, and at some particular point, it's going to be on the organization to actually start putting pieces together around a lot of the mentality and the things that he grew up understanding as being an assistant head coach that will give him an ability to have an identity. Right now, I think that he's a part of the machine. He's not the Neo of, you know, outside of the matrix looking to change, you know, the system itself. And it's going to be a few years before that happens because just some of the moves that have been made don't give you or lend you to the idea that there's going to be influenced by the head coach and the style of play that the Memphis Grizzlies would like to get to with their head coach than it would be what the organization's doing. Well, yeah, I think he's going to have a lot of rope with the, with the future of this franchise because, you know, they're going to be in a precarious uh, cap situation going into next summer. And I guess the next question I'd have is really what's the success for them this season? You know, if they get into the first round, whether they play San Antonio, whether they play Houston, if they if they win, they win one of those series and upset either one of those teams, then they probably do try to bring everything back. But if they don't win, which is obviously a very realistic possibility here as I'm going in as a lower seed in these playoffs, is it will it finally be time for them to break this thing up? And I know we talked about Zebo in our previous show. Um, he's a major free agent for them. Vince Carter, you know, father time, you know, he's catching up with him as well too. But he'll come back at a, at a minimum salary, and he, he, I'm sure he'd be happy to come back. But they also have a big question, which is Michael Green, 26 years old. Um, he's not going to be taken under a million dollars like he's making this season. So they already have 94 million dollars in cap space already assigned to this roster. They don't have a lot of money to go out there and get a whole bunch of free agents unless they can find somebody to take the walking corpse of Chandler Parsons. Otherwise, this team is cap stretched, and I don't see how they're going to continue to come back next season. Yeah, I, it, look, it, the, the problem that I have with this Memphis Grizzlies team is 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 who 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 out there outside of Conley, outside of Gasol, for a moment, let's just you know forget Parsons because what we're assuming is is that the Memphis Grizzlies are going to be tied up monetarily um, and don't have the capacity to put themselves in the mix to tout free agents. Let's be realistic. Given the Memphis Grizzlies and given the market, are there realistically a lot of guys that are planning to come or going to run to the Memphis Grizzlies to play basketball for that team, for that organization? No, right? Uh, most of these guys are going to be enamored with the marketability of some of the other major uh, market teams or even what we might call mid-major market teams. Memphis has more of an organic feel to them. They're the type of basketball team that I think needed to adopt the style of what the Golden State Warriors have done, which is take your homegrown talent and give them opportunity to flourish. Now, my thing is, is what is the organization going to really do about assessing the talent that they're trying to bring to the organization? They've brought guys like Jermichael Green, who adequately is, 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 a, is a decent player, but he hasn't done anything in, you know, this, this ultimately like, you know, jumped out at you and made you say and over the next three, five years, they really need to start considering what they want to do with him. He's supposed to be the heir replacement of Zach Randolph. And, to, and by all accounts, I, I feel like he's not given Bizdale or even the, um, the, the, the Memphis Grizzlies organization a reason for them to take minutes away from Zach Randolph for what Jermichael Green should be ultimately doing for them moving forward. And you can go down through a litany of certain of a lot of these players on that roster. My thing is, Shaw, is that even if the idea was is that you're trying to strip this team down to what it is and that money is heavily invested, what are they doing about assessing the direction that this team is going to be with the talent that they're looking at? Because they've had opportunities in draft picks. I think if we go back and we start looking at the draft selection players that have found themselves to be successful with other basketball teams, you can make an argument that the Memphis Grizzlies missed out on putting together, pulling some of these guys and putting them on their roster, that they could have actually been instant contributors and would have helped them much more successfully than what they're currently getting from the guys that they have on this roster right now. 
Well, your original point in terms of in terms of getting guys to actually come there, I think that's the reason Parsons went there because, well, where was he going to get that kind of money? And he knows Memphis is right. kind of star, you know, they're star starved. They can't get guys to go there on a regular basis. And now, as you alluded to, then by virtue of them making the playoffs this year, I think they end up conveying their draft pick to, I believe it's Denver or Portland in, in some swap that happened earlier on with the case. I can't remember the details of that, but now they don't have a first round pick this year. So they're going to have to be trying to trade into the draft potentially. Um, and they just don't have a lot of homegrown talent. We didn't even mention Tony Allen's also going to be a free agent. Again, he's 35 years old, but first team all defense as he as he is, and he's pretty much the heart of that grit and grind mentality. He's another guy that they're going to have to try to re-sign. They don't have enough money to even be able to, to re-up and come back next year in the same manner in which we've seen them. So that's right. the real question here. Zebo is going to gonna get more than $10 million, and he'll probably only sign a maybe a two- or three-year deal, but he's going to want more than $10 million, and that's what's going to put them over the cap just by that by that alone, let alone Tony Allen, who's, who's a key to their defense, as alluded to, Vince Carter, and you know, some of the other guys that are going to be on this roster, and not having any young guys to develop. So for me, although Fizdale's done a great job in terms of being a coach, it's really going to be kind of can they piece it together with some 10-day contracts and guys from the D league and guys who are willing to take the veteran minimum if you will to come to this team in order to continue to have the success that they have been having so and and, and so i guess then the follow-up point to this shaw is have they been have in other words have they been prolonging the inevitable for too long now right like we could have easily said that should the should the memphis grizzlies have thrown the kind of money that they threw at mike conley you know, and I'm listening. I'm not one to argue it. I think that if your if your intent is is that you want to show other free agents that we make commitments to our homegrown players, our guys that we have had on our basketball team for quite some time, we're gonna do that. Then you do what you got to do to get a guy like Mike. You know, to keep Mike Conley. But this is the this is the that's the second player that they've done that. They did that with Mark Gasol, and ultimately at some point, I have to think. That if you're going to do that, that you're going to take care of the other side of this. That it just can't be because you want to keep the the, the, the players that have been loyal and have stayed with this basketball team who have been the backbone of success. At some point, you're going to have to figure out a way to turn a corner. You have to find that balance. I just wonder if they prolong the inevitable of trying to hold, hold, hold this thing out to a point now where they have no other options in how they're going to quote unquote reconstruct this roster moving forward right well I, I think they have and maybe unintentionally so but re-signing Conley last year was a huge step in them trying to say okay well we we like the way we are and we're going to try to build around that may, at the time they made Conley the highest paid player in the NBA until LeBron ended up signing his contract you know, a couple of weeks after that um, again I hate to harp on it but Parsons contract is is immense for a guy who's not playing uh, they have to figure out a way, you know, I don't I don't think they can use a stretch provision, stretch provision on him. Um, I don't know if everybody would want to take that contract on, but they've got to figure out a way to to create some space. And maybe it's packaging some of these other guys who are very middling, middling guys. And, and I don't know that they have a whole lot of value. Let, I mean, let, let are me, you trading for Brandon Wright? Are let, you trading for Troy Daniels? I don't think so. Let me ask you this question, Shaw. Were you were you all in? Forget the money for a moment. Were you all in on the idea of Chandler Parsons being a part of the Memphis Grizzlies this year? I was, uh, yeah, I was in terms of what he was supposed to be able to provide. But you knew you're taking a risk with a guy who hasn't played in even 50% of his games for the last three seasons at this point. Like, I mean, that's just who he is. He's one of those guys who tantalizes you with his ability and his so so called talent. But what good is it if he never is on the court? And that's kind of where they're at. He's supposed to be a guy who can, you know, play make. Um, he's a decent passer, can shoot the three ball, all those things, can play the stretch four if you need him to. Um, and is again not a good defender, but I mean, whatever. He can he can do what he needs to do when it comes to guarding some guys on the wing. But he's not out there, and that to me, I think, is the biggest been the biggest disappointment. Um, he's already 28 years old, man. You know, and like I said, and not that that's old, if you will, but he's old another 75 million dollars over the next three years. I feel if like he has another I, season I, like this. I, I, what the hell are they doing? I feel like it's the Keith Van Horn effect. You know, just that's frightening. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it, it it very much is because it's the same situation that hampered the Dallas Mavericks, right? For a couple of years before they figured out a way to get around knowing that they still owed this dude money from that move coming from the New Jersey Nets. And so that's the reason why I sometimes feel like, wow, you know, um, it, it may be great in the beginning, best laid plans, best laid intentions, but I, I have to, I you know, I'm not trying to say, Shaw, I, I don't know why I'm on this kick about, you know, the establishment, right? And how sometimes we become enamored with 
the way that the establishment, it, 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 it looks to from the glaring eye. But once you start kind of scrubbing, you know, from the surface, and you really start getting right into the crevice of what really is truly pushing the agenda here, you begin to realize that it's not something that you want to be a part of, or it's not something that really looks good. And that to me is what I feel like is what's starting to emerge with the Memphis Grizzlies. Because in all honesty, I feel like the Memphis Grizzlies to me should be one of those basketball teams that we talk about with a level of respect, right? And I'm not saying that we don't. I'm just saying that we feel like it's tainted. It's kind of like the Cincinnati Bengals. Like everybody gets on top of the Cincinnati Bengals because they're a football team that should be winning in the playoffs. Like we should be talking about the Memphis Grizzlies because they've had two successful runs in the playoffs with what they've got. But at some point you're thinking to yourself, wow, all of this and they don't get to a championship. And you say that the same thing with teams like the Buffalo Bills and the Cincinnati Bengals. But let's be realistic. Where they are, the market that they represent, would you rather have a basketball team that suffers, you know, 15 years straight than has a one, two-year window of probably making it to an NBA Finals? Let's say they may win a championship and then they go right back to losing, you know, for another 15 years? Or do you want to see a sustained level of success? that you can at least envision somewhere down the road that they can find a way to get over the hump or to take it to that next level. I, I, that's that's my that's kind of the dichotomy I, I struggle with when I look at this Memphis Grizzlies team. I feel like that bend don't break thing now has been happening a little too long and with the uncertainty of figuring out that the future allows them to elevate to the level that they seem to be stopped at. Yeah, they're they're basically the Atlanta Hawks of the Western Conference, you know, in the same thing. Just make the playoffs. Except year after year people, year. Are, people are much <laughs> more supportive for the Memphis Grizzlies than people are to be supportive for the Atlanta Hawks. Like I feel like, with the exception of true Atlanta Hawks fans, which isn't yeah. a great number, that there is there isn't that real, true, genuine appreciation for the Atlanta Hawks like there is for people genuinely who are from Memphis or homegrown that one them that love the Memphis Grizzlies that really appreciate what the Memphis Grizzlies have done over the last five, six years. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I'll agree with that. I think Memphis's fan base is probably a little stronger than Atlanta's, but in terms of the, the franchise's success, you know, again, we had that year a couple years ago, Atlanta won 60 plus games and, you know, and, and then they get enrolled in, in the conference finals against the Cleveland Cavaliers or whatever it was. And then a few years before that, same thing, they get to the second round and they, they're always right there. You know, they're a team and, and probably not nearly as revered as Memphis is, but it's, it's the same, you know, it's the same argument. They, they continue to make the playoffs, but don't really get good enough and don't have a, a franchise type player, a superstar on their roster. They just stay in the middle of the pack, always somewhere in between that four and seven seed, if you will. And I know Memphis way back, I don't even know how years ago that like they were like, I think a, a two seed, I think at some point, you know, they got to the conference finals as well, but there's just, there's no way for them to get kind of get past that. Um, and while I agree with you that you want to have a certain level of success, you have to figure out a way to do basically what the Celtics have done, you know, where it's like, okay, you have a certain level of success. You maybe are bad for a year or two, but then you get right back into it. Um, and it doesn't seem like Memphis is going to be taking that step back, um, at least not voluntarily. <laughs> you know, it may happen as a result of, you know, the injuries and the things that they're going to be strapped against with the cap now. Um, but they're not voluntarily taking a step back to try to take a step, take a step forward. Final thought, Shock, because I'm, I'm really curious. You know, we talked a little bit earlier before about David Fisdale is, you know, um, what what we believe he is at, the, at this particular time frame, especially in his first year as the head coach for the Memphis Grizzlies. But I'm kind of curious from from your perspective, what would be that X factor, so to speak, um, for us to envision, you know, what we think the possibilities could be for the Memphis Grizzlies? Is it more on David Fisdale, the head coach, and bringing out the greatness of a guy like Marcus Gasol or, or Mike Conley? Or is it David Fisdale... Um, with a team-oriented mentality to collectively bring these guys together and be successful, very similar to what you see Brad Stevens is doing for the Boston Celtics. I I'm kind of curious because that's a that's a that's a heavy divide, right? Like I think people are are trying to fixate themselves on the idea that it's got to be Conley and it's got to be Gasol, and I don't know if either one of those guys are going to ever be on that type of level that we put the Steph Curry's, the LeBron James's, and maybe even the Kawhi Leonard's that we can honestly have that conversation about. 
So I'm wondering if it's going to come down to how the head coach and his mentality, his mantra, the direction of how he has these guys playing, if it's going to be individualistic or if it's going to be team oriented. I think it's team oriented. And at the same time, he can only work with what he's given. So do you end up getting one of your role players, you know, a la James Ennis, you know, to kind of really work extremely hard in the off season and figure out a way where you can maximize the the absolute best of his potential and his ability. Does Wade Baldwin actually turn into a player that doesn't, you know, kind of oscillate between the D League and 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 the, and the big club, if you will? You know, those are the type of things that that Memphis Grizzlies team is going to have to uh, really answer those types of questions. Um, because if they're as, again, if we alluded to the fact that they can't really get major free agents to come to this team, there's no real big trade for them out there to have. Then it's going to take one of their middling guys, one of their rotation guys, to kind of take another step up. And I'm not saying become an all star, a superstar, but they have to become a certain level to a certain level of consistency that Fizdell can deploy them out there on a regular basis. So, you know what? This guy's good for 13 to 14 points a night. You know, it's going to hit the three at 38 to 40 percent and, and X, Y, and Z. They need somebody else to help Conley and Gasol. And then again, we still don't even know if Zebo is going to be back. All right. The Memphis Grizzlies, as Shaw alluded to, currently in the seventh spot. Um, and it's going to be a very, very interesting scenario. Uh, do they have the propensity to catch the Oklahoma City Thunder? Do they want to catch the Oklahoma City Thunder and run in a head-on collision with the Houston Rockets, stay put, or take on the San Antonio Spurs? I mean, one thing is for certain, the Memphis Grizzlies, again, in the playoffs, but ultimately, what will this team become should they fall short of getting themselves to either the Western Conference Finals or ultimately to an NBA Finals? Nobody knows, but it's definitely something that we, def- we definitely want to keep our eye on on moving forward. You're tuned to the baseline. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. And this was the breakdown. Drop, drop, drop. Time now for the drop. Cal Lee, Warren Shaw of the Baseline NBA podcast. This week on the drop, interesting subject, topic, my man Shaw has thrown out there. Which basketball team? And there's three that we're gonna su- we're gonna select from that we're gonna discuss. Of these three basketball teams, which one has the brightest future ahead? Is it the Orlando Magic, the Phoenix Suns, or the Los Angeles Lakers? The, the first thing I want to know, Shaw, is how did you come to the conclusion of drawing on these three? Like, why not say the Sacramento Kings or, you know, maybe the Brooklyn Nets? Like, why specifically would we target these three teams to choose from as to being able to determine who amongst them would have the brightest future moving forward? Well, for me, I'm looking at these rosters and looking at, you know, kind of what the front office is like. You know, do they have at least a decent front office in place? Um, and that's very debatable <laughs> in the case of Orlando. Uh, but do they at least have, you know, some relatively young talent that the team can build around? Now, again, it's easy. And, and you know, I'm going to say there's a couple qualifiers here. I think there's no reason to have a discussion about the Minnesota Timberwolves. We know that they're you know, have a lot of great young talent. And of all the teams, you'd rather probably be the Minnesota Timberwolves if, if that's the case in terms of maybe getting to that next step. You can even maybe include the Bucks into that right now, but they're a playoff team. So we know that they're 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 rising. I think we're looking at three teams here now who are obviously headed for the lottery, um, potentially all having top five picks within that lottery selection and organizations that that seem to have uh, a lot on their shoulders. I think Orlando's in a very interesting situation um, with with Rob Hennigan. Is interesting um, the right word you want to choose for this one, Shaw? For, for the uh, Orlando Magic? Uh, tenuous, maybe. <laughs> um, because we don't know skittish. what's happening with Hennigan. I like to use the Hennigan. word skittish. I like to use um, the word skittish. And then we have, obviously, the LA Lakers, which is a, obviously a great story franchise, bringing in Rob Palenka and Magic Johnson now to run their affairs in the front office. Um, and great young talent on the floor with D'Angelo Russell and Julius Randle, Jordan Clarkson, and Brandon Ingram. Well, you know, what's, what's that situation going to be like? And, you know, again, Phoenix Sun. We're talking about a guy like Devin Booker who just scored 70 points against the Boston Celtics a, a couple weeks ago here now. Um, and nice talent in terms of Marquise Chris. Got to figure out what they're going to do with Alex Len. TJ Warren seems to be like he's going to be a player. Even Tyler Eulis, who they basically playing now instead of Eric Bledsoe, um, you know, they're evaluating all their talent. So these are three great teams that have uh, very unique futures ahead of them. And I think if things break the right way, it could all be very big, big factors in the respective conferences. Well, I listen, I I completely agree with you. Um, I guess it's how you determine when we say brightest future ahead, because when I say brightest future ahead, like to me, the, the way that the NBA moves right now, it's pretty rapidly. Um, right. you know, we, we, we talk about, you know, a couple of these guys 
guys like Brandon Knight, right? We talk about, you know, guys like Eric Bledsoe. It was only like three, four years ago we were talking about how these guys are, are, are quote unquote, the future of the NBA, so to speak. And then all of a sudden now we're sneaking in, you know, other players other than those guys. And they were part of this roster that we're talking about with reference to the Phoenix Suns. You know, um, Alfred Payton, you know, th this guy comes in. Um, somehow he pretty much upsets the apple cart because I thought the future was Victor Oladipo for the Orlando Magic, right? Um, you know, Nikola Vucevic. They 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 trade this guy. Uh, they trade to get this guy from the F Philadelphia 76ers. Ergo, the start of the process, right? In the Sam Hinkie era. And what we basically now see from Vucevic is, you know, does he is he someone that should stay there in Orlando or should they move this guy because he could probably be better suited elsewhere and his talents could actually flourish in other places because for some reason it just doesn't seem to flourish with the Orlando Magic. So I just wonder when we talk about brightest future ahead when we look at these teams and we're assessing them, how, how far ahead are we talking about the future? Is the future within the next two years or is the future within the next five years? Because it, it seems like the, the, the momentum for the future stars seems to blink in a flash and these organizations just still seems to find a way to continue to lag behind and are not doing enough to give these future stars opportunities to flourish. Yeah, I think with all things being equal for the purposes of the conversation, we may want to say, okay, which team do we think is probably the l most likely to reach the playoffs first? And obviously there's a whole bunch of factors that come into that. Obviously the draft and what other teams do within the respective conferences and all of those things too. But, you know, looking at the roster kind of as it stands, um, you know, which guy, which team seems to has, has, have the best building blocks currently in place. Um, and then, you know, kind of even terms for, have to look at their front office as well. I think the conference is going to play uh, – a little bit of a factor in the discussion, especially in the case of Orlando, um, because you would tend to think that it might be easier for an Eastern Conference team, you know, to get out of the lottery into a, a seven seed, if you will, and finally make the playoffs, as many, you know, incorrectly pr predicted that they would be able to do this year. But they have a weird mix of veterans and young guys on this team. So I think that's for me where I'd want to kind of focus the, the the discussion as we talk about these three franchises. All right. So, all right, let's go ahead and let's, let's look at it for what it is. I, I hate to be the pessimist about this, y'all, because you pick basically three teams where – they sit at the very bottom of their own total pole in their own division. The yes, Phoenix sir. Suns and the Los Angeles Lakers. I, the window for them, any one of these teams that have a future to be able to get ahead means that they marketably are going to have to be better than the Sacramento Kings. They're going to marketably have to be better than probably the Los Angeles Clippers, right? Let's not even worry about the other teams that are in other divisions that are occupying ahead of them in the playoff chase. So if we're, you know, if, if we're basing it on the standard of which team is likely to get to the playoffs first, I guess for my money, if I'm talking about assurances to get to the playoffs first, to me, it's going to come down to either the Los Angeles Lakers or the Orlando Magic. Now, I could look at the Orlando Magic and I could probably say that basketball team has more opportunity to maybe get to a playoff, uh, to get off and get, get into the playoffs because the unpredictability of the Southeast division allows that opportunity for the for what the Magic currently have. And if somehow Hannigan can flip on the switch and get out of whatever funk that he's been in the last few years with the way that he does you know, certain transactions, could actually make a couple of decent moves, and this Magic team could very much be in the picture of winning the Southeast division, which would mean that they are in the, 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 the chase to be in the playoffs in the Eastern Conference, which could be open to any number of scenarios. Hmm. If I flip it to the Los Angeles Lakers, however, just the cachet of Magic Johnson and Jeannie Buss means that there is money to be thrown out by the Los Angeles Lakers to bring in a quality free agent to supplement some of the talented pieces that they have. Now, when I look at talented pieces, and maybe that's where we gauge it, guys like Julius Randle, Larry Nance, I think about, and you still have Luau Dang, and you still got Timothy Mozgov. A good free agent pickup could easily put them with or without D'Angelo Russell because if the Lakers wind up being in the lottery and they somehow luckily find themselves with the conversation of should we keep Russell or should we go after Lonzo Ball, you know what they're going to do. 
But I just think that this basketball team could be more workable with no matter what kind of point guard that you have because it's the Los Angeles Lakers. They have the money. They have the cachet now. And they have the free market at their disposal, something that I fear that the Magic, even if they had it at their disposal, have not been making good choices to supplement a talent that Vogel can work with within the time span that's going to allow them to get to a playoff faster than the Lakers. So let me go ahead and attack it from a different way. You know, I think of the three teams, the guy, the team that has the most franchise-ish player on their roster is probably Phoenix, right? I don't think right. we would take anybody above Devin Booker on all these three teams. Devin Booker is probably the best player of all of all three guys here. But then the question is, okay, well, who's who comes in after that? Right. Orlando has has Aaron Gordon. They have Alfred Payton. You know, I'm not going to throw his name out there as lofty as that, if you will. Too Vucevic is not young issue. He's 20, 26, I think now, um, but still very very good player. Um, Evan Fournier are, is, you know, he's a good basketball player, but not in, in the running of that. So you have to go back to the Lakers now. And then it becomes D'Angelo Russell, Julius Randle, and Brandon Ingram. All those names are extremely buzzy. So, but do they have more value than Aaron Gordon? You know, and, and that is that to me is very challenging. So I think the Lakers with Polinka and Magic Johnson have the most equity um, built around the league in terms of the, the players on the roster that they'd be willing to give up because I don't think Phoenix is willing to give up Devin Booker. Um, and then, you know, with Magic Johnson and Rob Palenka having the kind of the pedigree that they have around the league and, and the reputation to maybe be able to, you know, in terms of getting things getting things done in the relationships they have with other teams. If they're willing to break up that core, if you will, and it may only take two of those four, um, then they can get a star back. If you trade D'Angelo and Julius Randle, maybe you get something or Ingram and Randle or Ingram and Russell or whatever, Clarkson, throw, throw whatever. They have the biggest... Uh, cachet in a sense to play around with to get better quickly. So for me, I feel like they're going to do that. And as you alluded to, obviously going to be very involved in this year's draft and potentially get a guy like Lonzo Ball to come into this franchise and really help them immediately. So if you were asking me which team has the, the clearest path to potentially getting best quickly, I'd actually say it's the Lakers. Um, and I'm very concerned about Orlando's front office because I don't think it's going to be the same front office that we've seen this year. No, oh, no, no question. I think that when you look at when you look at the Orlando Magic, and, and again, it's a, it's a conundrum. It's something that I continually scratch my head on where I just – when I look at what these guys do, and I don't follow the Orlando Magic every single night, but when I look at what this, this team does, it's hard for me to imagine why they cannot or they are not as nearly competitive as what I thought that they should be in that Southeast division. Look, I'm not going to be tooting my horn about my predictions that the Washington Wizards are going to be a sleeper team – um, and win the division. I, I didn't think that they were capable of winning the division more so that I just thought that they just were a better team from a continuity perspective. But you can see the roster and clearly tell that there's no excuse why this team should not be competitive in that division. When I look at the Orlando Magic in comparison to the rest of the other rosters that are out there, minus youth, it's hard to imagine how they're not competitive at this point. I just, I, I just sense like there are missing pieces that are not indicative of what we were seeing from this team when they drafted these players. Like the growing pains of Elfrey Payton, I kind of thought that that would be offset because you had Victor Oladipo and you had Vucevic. Aaron Gordon, you know, not being fully cemented. And I thought that you'd have that because you had Vucevic, right? And then you had a couple of, of, of supplementary parts around you that could kind of facilitate these guys going through their growing pains and eventually getting themselves where they're now established as starters. I just have not been able to see it come together in that manner, even getting Vogel as a head coach. And it just makes you wonder that as long as there is this window of opportunity where everything is up for grabs in the Southeast Division and even the Eastern Conference. Because look, even now to this point, we're talking about, well, how much confidence do we still see the Cleveland Cavaliers going to an NBA Finals year in and year out, right? We're questioning it now, even with what LeBron James has at his disposal. This to me is where a lot of these teams that have not managed to figure out how to win this is their moment. This is their opportunity to shine. And there's just still so, so many question marks. that, And I think it's it, it attacks to the talent part of it because now we're saying that as talented as these guys are, they're not good enough to win. So we already disqualify them. And that's why it just seems like a much easier path for teams like the Phoenix Suns and the Los Angeles Lakers simply because of that type of dichotomy. But we say the Lakers with more confidence because there's more backing them to get to that point of being successful again. 
Agreed. And, you know, I think Orlando's a team I'm least excited about, you know, when it comes to this, to this trio. Right, I agree with you. Because of many of the reasons that you, just, that you just mentioned. Yeah, the Phoenix you know, but, Suns, the Phoenix Suns actually have better players that you can foresee them. If you put them on other basketball teams that where needs need to be addressed, like if you put Eric Bledsoe with the Dallas Mavericks, or you sent, my God, it, it might actually... Make it make us it may actually make us re-question Doc Rivers and what he did, um, not being able to keep Eric Bledsoe. I know he wasn't going to be able to, but I'm just saying it, it just makes you question. You know, would it have been worth keeping Eric Bledsoe, given what Bledsoe was doing for that basketball team, to allow him to go somewhere else? And he's now in obscurity, and the Los Angeles Clippers are still one or two players shy of being a marquee play could have changed the perspective of how we saw things with the Clippers and the Golden State Warriors when they were at each other's throat at that time. Right. And and again, I think Phoenix is in a, in a very great situation because they have guys that they could potentially move if, if really if push came to shove. Tyson Chandler, you know, two years left, $26 million left on his deal. Um, veteran guy, rebounder. We all know what, what his pedigree is. Um, they could very easily move him and maybe get something back for him of, of, of use. But, you know, this is a team I think they're, they're very – caught in the middle in terms of what do they want to do because they tried to go with a nice mix of veterans and youth, you know, getting Jared Dudley and as alluded to Tyson Chandler on this team, um, but it just hasn't really panned out. But now Bledsoe, Brandon Knight is obviously going to have to go. Something has to happen with his situation this summer. Those are two point guards that may or may not both be back with this team next year. You know, they may hand the keys over to Tyler Eulis and, and Devin Booker and let those guys kind of ride things out. Alex Lynn, I, I would expect to be gone. Um, Marquise Chris has played great in, you know, in getting sense becoming the starting power forward for them. Uh, Dragon Bender has been in and out of lineup with his injuries. Alan Williams has played great, you know, uh, you know, at 24 years old, and uh, he's going to be up for uh, for a contract extension. They have a lot of like spare parts, if you will, that they can really build around. Um, and I, I think if they decide to really move on from Bledsoe, um, and obviously they have to do it with Brandon I, as I said, they could get good really quickly because I think Devin Booker is the type of guy that you can build around. You know, I don't know if he's if he's Clay Thompson just yet. Um, but we're starting to see those signs. And we all know if Clay Thompson was, you know, kind of the man on his own roster, on his own team, you know, without having to play around with Stephen Curry and Kevin Durant, Clay would be a guy who averages 28.5 to 28 points a game um, and leading his team into the playoffs. No. So I think Booker has that type of potential. Oh, Booker definitely, to me, has that type of potential. And I, what's interesting, Shaw, is is that you, you know, I, I remember kind of trying to, trying to, kind of following what had happened with Klay Thompson because I think a lot of people were saying, wow, you know, this guy coming out of Washington State, look for this dude. You know, he came in just as we were trying to figure out where his game could potentially go because at that time frame, the mid-range game was still very relevant. And then all of a sudden, things started shifting in the direction of the three-point shot, you know, beyond the arc, shooting more from three. And so suddenly... You see Klay Thompson's game elevate from him having to be someone that had to work down in the post and take advantage of of his size and his his is is um and his height uh, against smaller guys that are playing that two guard position and things of that nature to where he's equally shooting the basketball at a clip very similar to what we see from guys like Ray Allen and 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 guys like Latrell Freewell and and you know what I'm saying like it, it he just. In in in, ver in a flick of an eye, like a, just in an instant, and suddenly his credibility shot up even further when he actually was one of their quality defenders, right? I don't know if it was so much it was being labeled, but it was you, that's how it was. And so I begin to wonder when I look at the rosters for both the Magic, for both the Suns, and I look at the at the Lakers, if there's somebody that has that potential that can easily translate his game fluidly to other parts where you see an evolution of a player that we probably weren't talking about when they first came out in the draft, Devin Booker would be that guy. The question is, from head coach to organization, how much confidence do they have in dedicating themselves to that concept, to that idea? Because that's one thing that I can give the Houston Rockets credit for. They saw that in James Harden. And they're willing to live with James Harden being so so defensively to gift them with all of what he brings offensively to the table. Because now what you see from James Harden, we can admonish some of the deficiencies that he has defensively. But you could also make the argument 
that it's been a vast improvement from what he showed you playing with Oklahoma City and the first two seasons playing under the Houston Rockets, that he can continue to be better at what he's doing. And I think at some point you have to start looking at your talent, your roster in that kind of manner. Aside from the deficiencies, what they bring to you from a positive perspective, can it flourish and it, can it can it be infectious to the rest of the team that you look at them as the cornerstone player? And both the Lakers and the Magic seem to lack that because they have not divested themselves in either of their, their, their players, whether they've done it through trade or they've done it through the draft, to say that they're committed to those guys. And I think that might be to their downfall no matter how much money they throw at the problem. Well, I think that's an interesting point because – it could very well be argued, and it would seem crazy to say at this point, but Orlando might be more invested in Aaron Gordon than the Lakers are invested in D'Angelo Russell, Jordan Clarkson, yeah. Julius Randle, yeah. yeah. and, and maybe, maybe. And at some point, we were saying the same thing about the Phoenix Suns prior to Devin Booker, because right. they did this with Brandon Knight, they did this with Eric Bledsoe, they did this with Isaiah Thomas, and we did this with about 15 and 16 other guards that probably are doing better in the NBA now than playing under the Phoenix Suns roster. Yeah, but if you were to ask me, which player is most likely to finish their uh, finish their uh, their off season on the same team? It would be Aaron Gordon and Devin Booker. I I don't have that same confidence for any of the Lakers. You know, four guys. Uh, I think it'd be stunning to see all four of them back with that team next year. Um, as I feel like they just want to make make moves to get better quickly. I don't care what Magic Johnson is saying in the media. But, and it, does, the but right it, things. Right, it exactly because it tells you more so about the impressions of where the organization sees this roster and under Mitch Kupchak than it would be under Magic Johnson and Jeannie Buss looking at this roster and what they want to see from this team moving forward. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, we all know what it is. Like, we we, we were questioning a couple of weeks ago why D'Angelo was moved to the bench. And it was really to kind of test his mettle and see, you know, was he going to whine and pout and figure it out? Now they have them playing along, alongside Clarkson at the two um, and seeing, it, okay, is he better on the ball or off the ball as, as, as a point guard or as a shooting guard? So they're still very much evaluating what they want to do with him specifically. Um, Brandon Ingram is probably the safest of all those guys, you know, to probably return. Um, but it doesn't seem like they're they're terribly enamored, although they like they like their guys and they're not going to give them away for anything. Um, the Slager team seem to be the most in flux. But again, it also seems like with those types of names that are there and that the fact that they have played relatively well this season, they could in turn get some great value back for them and get good immediately. Real quick, Shaw, before we end end off this segment, which has been a great topic of discussion because I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that we were able to fly through three teams like like this in in like less than 22 minutes but do you think magic johnson is vying into brandon ingram and like in other words do you think this new regime is going to buy into the future of what brandon ingram represents is or is it they're they're looking at this because of the fact that he's 19 years old and he came from duke and you know they're going to probably try and, and and wait this thing out are they really going to try and figure out a way to, to, to invest themselves in in developing this guy to be who they want him to be moving forward? I think what, what ends up happening in the NBA is you get recency bias, and that's just what it boils down to. So he he's only been there a year, or <laughs> D'Angelo's been there two. Julius technically has been there three now. Um, Clarkson well, has been there two as well, too. So it seems just seems like, okay, they have, they have more of a body of work, although it isn't much more to go on with the other guys. I think they're going to give Ingram a little bit more rope, and that might only be another year. Um, but I feel like he's probably the one that they're going to stick with. So they are, at least for now, a little bit more enamored with him, only because they haven't seen enough to see what he can really do. All right, man. Well, there you have it. We want to hear from you. Who do you think has the brightest future ahead? Is it the Los Angeles Lakers? Is it the Phoenix Suns? Or is it the Orlando Magic? Hit us up on at NBA Baseline is the Twitter handle. And uh, hashtag up the drop and let us know what you think, man. I mean, we're really interested in trying to see from our avid listeners if you believe that either one of these three teams, which of these three teams actually has the brightest future ahead amongst each other. You're tuned to the baseline. Cali, Warren Shaw discussing the hot button topics of the NBA. And this was the drop. Time to go coast to coast discussing the news in the association. You ready to rock and roll, Mr. Shaw? Absolutely, man. Let's ride. All right. Yusuf Nurkic, Jaleel Okafor, Robert Covington. What do they all have in common? Oh, and Derrick Rose. What do they all have in common? <laughs> <laughs> Just throw that in there. Huh? <laughs> they gone. Uh, unfortunately, injuries, man, have, have, have hampered 
all of these guys they are now gone for the rest of the regular season i think it's a foregone conclusion who is mostly going to be impacted by these injuries clearly the portland trailblazers not having nurtured down this stretch run while they're comfortably in that eighth spot uh that eighth spot of the western conference shaw if he is not ready to go by the time that the first round uh takes off it, there ain't gonna be no taking off in portland yeah, I, I agree with that 100 percent. Definitely the biggest knock of any of the teams out there because, well, he's the only one who, who is, is playing for a playoff team to begin with. So Okafor, I think it probably just causes more problem for Philadelphia in, in terms of will they be able to move him in the offseason if he continues to prove that he's not healthy. Rose, it sucks for him because he was playing pretty well on, on a you know a less than stellar New York Knicks team. Um, and he's just trying to get his numbers up so that he can boost his value in the summer. And now he's going to be gone with with another knee injury. So that, that sucks. Um, definitely for him, I think more so for his agent and trying to negotiate a contract for him this, this summer. And Robert Covington, you know, just a solid basketball player with the 76 is really like. Hopefully he'll be back next year and be ready to go. Yeah. I'm just a little bummed that Nurkic is, 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 is gone, man, because I, I just want to hear him talk some more smack about the Denver Nuggets between now and the end of the regular season. So this kind of yeah. takes kind of take kind of takes the fun out of this whole thing, man. You know, when you drop 31 and 16, you pretty much can say whatever you want to say. And uh, to, you know, off the air, Shaw, before we recorded the show, man, I told you how my man is just, you know, he ain't bashful. You know what I'm saying? He don't let his international accent hinder him in any way, shape, or form in expressing how he feels about how the Denver Nuggets are going to spend the summer going, going fishing with the rest of everybody else, man. So, you got to uh, let your whole team have like, it, man. They didn't give him no burn. Hey, man, it's an early go on get for the Denver <laughs> Nuggets right there, boy. So uh, they're they going to have to find – they're going to have to look at the – Look at that situation, boy. But it sucks, though, that Nurtures is out for at least the rest of the regular season. Hopefully, he'll be back by the playoff times because it will be an intriguing matchup between them and the uh, Golden State Warriors. All right. Out in uh, Detroit, I mean, listen, man. It, if I was the Detroit Pistons, I probably would be, you know, out trying to get hung over <laughs> like yeah. KCP. But what you don't want to be doing is getting arrested for driving under the influence. You know, just not a good look for KCP, who by all accounts, Shaw, has really had a great, great season for it to be marred by this. Listen, the disappointment of not making the playoffs is one thing, but this is just definitely not a good look. And I would expect that there's going to be uh, some also, that there's going to be ramifications um, and, and consequences from the NBA because of this situation too. Yeah, 100%. Something will definitely go down, but the Pistons are standing behind and Van Gundy is like, listen, we know he's a high character dude. You know, obviously made a mistake um, as young guys tend to do and, you know, making some levity of a situation that I guess really isn't all that funny, but you're right. <laughs> They've had a season that would drive anybody to drink, so hopefully he does so responsibly from here on out, man. Yeah, he. <laughs> that's just not even right. <laughs> Uh, oh my goodness uh listen man uh, and, and again uh, to me again great season by kcp and it's just kind of you know kind of washed away you know with the stench of disappointment from this pistons basketball team that i had high hopes should have you know replicated what they did last season and making the playoffs so you know better days ahead kcp better days ahead all right uh lebron james what more can be said about the king he figures out a way to pass Shaquille O'Neal as the seventh all-time scorer. I, you know, it's interesting, Shaw, when asked about it, LeBron James was so mad because it was all because <laughs> it was because of the Cavaliers lost anyway. So maybe in some way down the road, we might even show more exuberance than LeBron James did about him passing Shaq seventh all-time. Even Shaq had to be like, it's all right, LeBron. I know you're feeling some kind of way right now, but I'm happy that you passed me, man. <laughs> Yeah, and it's funny because like there's a little video and some some news got out there that Shaq destroyed a TNT studio, kind of all in good humor, if you will. Learning that LeBron passed. Yeah, I saw that. LeBron's... That was so lame. I'm sorry. That <laughs> was yeah. that was the worst. It was the worst choreographed segment skit scene. And oh, surprisingly, Scott. Surprisingly enough, you know what I'm saying. 3D was in it, and I was like, oh, my goodness. Like, they, they yeah. trying hard, man. They trying yeah. too hard, Trying to get bro. the WWE on a little oh bit there, God. a little bit. But, you know, LeBron and Shaq, they're, they're boys. You know, and early in the year when, when Charles Barkley went after LeBron, Shaq didn't like it and went on at, went back on him on air. So um, he understands that, you know, LeBron is one of the best to ever do it. And, you know, to see LeBron continue to – I don't know, how many how – many, how many people has he passed in, in different categories, assists and uh, points and rebounds this year? It feels like we've talked about it maybe every other week, at least every month, in some sort of statistical anomaly that he's done at his at, at tender age that he is currently. Yeah, man, just 
just crazy. It, it's just remarkably crazy. But, you know, nevertheless, congratulations, LeBron James. Um, you know, again, another accomplishment, another feat. Check it off the list. And I'm sure that there's going to be many more to come um, as long as he continues to play at the level that he's playing. Finally, Shaw, big, big shout outs to this year's the 2017 uh, Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame to the class of 2017. Headlining it, our man, T-Mac, the phenom, the phenomenal one, um, one of the youngest in this class. Very heads a very impressive list of uh, of people being inducted in the class. Jerry um, uh, Jerry Reinsdorf, uh, of course, um, you know, Krass. So, I'm sorry, Jerry Crass, but Jerry Reinsdorf had said in his speech, you know, that you know Jerry Crass was was well deserved and definitely someone who deserves to be in that class. Uh, Rebecca Lobo also in that class. Bill Self from from Kansas, even though I'm sure he would have traded that in to see his Kansas Jayhawks playing in the NBA, uh, I'm sorry, into the national championship picture. Um, just really a great class of people being inducted, headlined by Tracy McGrady. Kudos to my man. Yeah, 100%, you know, and for me, um, on a personal note, I'm a little sad. You know, I didn't think T-Mac would get in over Weber, um, but he did. <laughs> and, and I'm not hating on T-Mac. I think that's great for him and all the all the other candidates got in, especially Rebecca Lobo, Bill Self, and, and people of that ilk. Um, but if you're Chris Weber and Tim Hardaway and guys like that, you're kind of just like, damn, you know, <laughs> you know what about us? Maybe so, maybe that's why T-Mac is on ESPN and and, and not on uh, and, and not on NBA on TNT. Yeah, I, I'm just – I haven't yeah. heard again. I haven't heard Weber's reaction, but I'm. I think he has just as good a case as as T Mac did. So, little shock. Don't know really what the the politics is behind that. Uh, but again, Why is it always got to be politics, guys. man. It's always got to be politics. Uh, there's a, there's something. <laughs> there's something there. Our show, our show I mean, could have been all didn't about, get in either, too, man. So I, I mean, you know, hey, our show could have been all about pol- could have been all about politics. Well, right? I think you've had a Trump reference in at least five of the last six shows, man. So you're definitely on your political feeling, science I've, grind. I've, here, I've, man. Been, I've been feeling some some kind of way. I think uh, MSNBC might need to put me on like at the rate that I'm going right now. You know what I'm saying? I might have to, I might be start pulling out, you know, like Obamacare, like T-Mac O'Care or something like that. It's just crazy references is just jumping out of my head, man. Like, what can I, I see do? that. <laughs> I, see, I think, and I think our fans and listeners, I think they, they enjoy it, man. You know, kind of the alternate facts and discussions that we may have on, on the show from time to time here, brother. <laughs> hey man, don't put me in the, don't, don't put me in, in a Sean Spicer, man. I <laughs> got you. I got you. <laughs> Wrong right, Sean, that. man. Wrong Sean. I ain't that kind of Sean. <laughs> Awesome show this week once again, my man. Um, you know a lot of a lot of good stuff, and I'm you know it's funny, man. Before we blink our eyes, Shaw, we got some really really good shows on the come up over the next week or so, bro. I, I think people are gonna really be um, enamored, uh, gonna be happy, gonna be glad. Uh, like 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 Trump said, it's gonna be a beautiful thing. It's just it's gonna be so beautiful. It's gonna be so easy. <laughs> well, I mean, we got to continue to, you know, to bring some variety, you know, to our podcast and to our listeners out there because, you know, we don't we don't ever want to be stale and the NBA continues to provide us with fresh content and we need to continue to keep our show fresh. So without teasing it any, you know, more than we already have, we definitely have, like you said, some some great concepts and some great ideas that I think that we're going to be throwing your way um, as a playoff strong and as we go through the NBA playoffs this um, upcoming few weeks, bro. Yeah, definitely. And we just want to encourage everyone to continue to ride with the baseline NBA podcast and man. Uh, Kyle Lee, my brother, Warren Shaw, we love doing this, man, and this is an exciting time as we head down the final stretch of basketball games in the regular season, and we run right into the playoffs. We're going to have great guests on board to help us break down the playoff picture. We'll also have some quality people and personalities who are going to discuss, you know, the matchups and everything that really just goes into the hype and the, the allure of, of NBA playoff season is, I mean, listen, this is the second half. The first half is done. Regular season is pretty much a wrap. Now we get into the good stuff, which is the second half. It's zero, zero across the board. And really it takes 16, like our man on their, on our website, 16 wins, uh, 16 ring, uh, wins to get a ring. And that's exactly what's going to take place. Which team gets to 16 wins in order to hold up that O'Brien Trophy, and we can't be uh, wait to be the ones to discuss it, break it down, and 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 to give you the goods on what you need to know and get yourself prepared for this upcoming NBA playoff season. Once again, for the baseline, Cali, Warren Shaw, we appreciate each and every single one of you. You know we do. We'll catch up with you next time.